Uh, it's Comeback Sunday. And uh, what, when we say Comeback Sunday, we're passionate about this, that it is not just about people uh, coming to Easter and then coming back this week. If you did come back, we're grateful. But more than just like marketing or anything like that, this is a declaration of your life. And I think we've got the testimony to prove it, that this is a great day for a comeback. This is a great day uh, to see God do something fresh in your life. And I don't know if you can feel it, but there is faith in the room today. This is a great day for hopeless people to find hope. This is a great day for people who have been living in darkness to come into light. This is a great day to be set free in the presence of God. And I believe that more than just coming back to church, but there's going to be a comeback in your faith, in your heart, in your life, in your mind today. I believe that. And uh, I believe it's going to be powerful today. Uh, I grew up, just a little bit about me, I grew up in a small town called Effingham, Illinois. You heard it correctly, Effingham, Illinois. I'm a preacher. I'm a man of God, so I don't use swear words. But sometimes when I would like to use swear words, I replace it with the name of my hometown, Effingham, <laughs> Illinois. Thank you. And uh, as, as if the name of our town wasn't incredible enough, the name of our team at our school was even better. We were the Flaming Hearts. That's right. The Effingham Flaming Hearts. You see on your schedule that you're going to be playing the Effingham Flaming Hearts this Friday. You start shaking in your shoes. Because there's nothing more intimidating than a bunch of 17-year-old men who call themselves the Effingham Flaming Hearts. Effingham was a small-ish town. I knew the whole town like the back of my hand. I could get to most of the places on bicycle. And uh, there was one particular area in Effingham, uh, right across from Joe's Bait Shop, in case you're interested, uh, where I, I would pass by this abandoned house. And this abandoned house was ugly. Uh, it had broken windows. It had missing floorboards. It had rotten wood. And I remember even as a young man passing by this house and thinking, who would want to live in that house? Like you'd have to be desperate if you wanted to live in that house. You'd have to have no other options if you wanted to live in that house. That house was in need of a comeback to say the very least. And all throughout history, we've seen people like this. We've seen people in scripture who needed a comeback. David needed a comeback after he sinned with Bathsheba. Moses was in need of a comeback after he murdered an Egyptian man. And, and I believe there's many people in this room, your comeback probably isn't that dramatic, but you are in need of a comeback, whether you're at the lowest of lows or you feel like you've just been feeling off spiritually lately, God has a comeback available for you today. And I was looking, I was studying the scripture, and I found a place where all of humanity was in need of a comeback. And at the end of the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament is called Malachi. The first book of the New Testament is called Matthew. And for us, it's a turn of a page. But in history, there were 400 years in between Malachi and Matthew. And we call it in history, we call it the 400 years of silence. No words from God. No fresh revelation, no preachers rising up and preaching the truth of God's word. Can you imagine uh, just the ramifications that that would have on a society? Can you imagine the immorality that people turned to? Can you imagine the confusion that they had? Can you imagine how rampant atheism was? If God was real, wouldn't he be speaking? So all of humanity is in need of a comeback. And then the book of Matthew starts and Jesus shows up on the scene. So I thought, man, this Sunday I'm preaching on comebacks. This is going to be easy because all of humanity was in need of a comeback. I'll just look at what was the first message that Jesus preached. And so I searched in the scripture and I found the first message that Jesus preached. It was a nine word message in Matthew 4, 17. He said these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. My message is going to be a little bit longer than nine words today, but this was Jesus' message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The key to your comeback today is found in the word repent. And it gets heavy in the room because if I were to ask most of the people right now, what does the word repent mean? I would probably get similar answers from most of you. You would say, well, to repent means to do a 180. 
Repent means to turn and go in the other direction. Repent maybe means for you to be sorrowful for your sins, to, to cry. It means to turn from sin and to turn to God. The only problem with that definition of repentance is that it's wrong. The word repent in the New Testament is the Greek word metanoia, and it means change your mind. Change the way that you think. And this differentiation is so important because if we try to change our behavior before we change our mind, then we're placing the expiration date on our life change. If, if I try to change my way of living before I change my way of thinking, then I'm not going to make it. Right thinking leads to right living. This is why Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, don't be conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed in what? The, the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is synonymous with repentance. So I believe that a key to your comeback is to repent. To repent means to change your mind, and today we're going to change our mind about three things. Now, preachers, you're not supposed to give your points at the very beginning. You're supposed to, like, reveal them like a rabbit out of a hat, like, and point number two is this. And everyone's like, ooh, ah. But I'm giving you all three points at the very beginning of the message today. We're changing our mind about three things. We're going to change our mind about God. We're going to change our mind about ourselves. And from that, we're going to change our mind about sin. And there's a scripture in the New Testament, a beautiful comeback story, uh, that helps us change our mind about all three of these things. Turn with me to John chapter 8 and verse 1. We're going to read through verse 11. I'm reading in the New King James Version, a.k.a. King Jimmy. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. So this is a church setting. This would be like if Jesus got up on a Sunday morning, grabbed a microphone, and began to teach the word of God like I'm teaching you the word of God right now. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And I'm wondering, are they going to wait till he's done teaching to interrupt him? Nope. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. So this, they just made this church service really, really awkward. They interrupted Jesus' teaching, sets this woman in the midst and says, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And then they say, in the very act. I'm like, they are so dramatic. Yes, Jesus, we caught her. Did I mention in the very act? Yes, you did. You're so dramatic, Pharisees. And they said her in the midst, teacher, we caught this woman in, in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Well, what do you say? If I was Jesus, I'd be like, I say, let's talk about it after this. <laughs> hey, move on. This they said, testing him, that they might have something which to accuse him. But Jesus, whew, I love those two words, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. This is like the moment where the person in the movie who's on the other side of a gun says, Yeah, go ahead and pull the trigger. Jesus is like, Yeah, it, do it if you're bad. Go ahead and throw the stone. If, if you're without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. It says, and Jesus alone was left. Isn't that so true of so many seasons in our life? Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is possibly one of the most beautiful and powerful demonstrations of the radical love of Jesus that we can find in the New Testament. And I believe it's going to help us think differently about God. It's going to help us think differently about ourselves. And it's going to help us think differently about sin. So let's dive in. The first thing, if you're taking notes, we need to change the way we think about God. Change the way we think about God. You know, we oftentimes view God as a distant, frustrated person. Here's how we view God. Like, if I'm good, God is happy. 
If I'm bad, God is angry. If I'm praying, then God is close. If I'm not praying, then God is distant. If I'm in my word, he's proud of me. If, I'm, if my Bible is collecting dust, then, then he's ashamed of me. And we have bought the lie that God is as fickle as our human emotions. And we've said God is distant and God is angry. I, um, my wife and I have been married for almost nine years, nine years in June. And uh, here's the obligatory clap when you mention how many years you and your wife have been married. That's your, that's your part. But we met at 13 years old, and uh, it was love at first sight for her, and um, <laughs> understandably so. I had the early 2000s Justin Bieber hair, you know what I mean? It like covered my eyes until I majestically swooped it back like that. <laughs> I had braces, had a couple different rows of teeth on top and bottom. And every time I wore a collared shirt, I popped it. You know what I'm saying? Any millennials remember ever since I can remember? I've been, and, uh, and so it was hypnotic to say the least. And Kaylee, <laughs> Kaylee fell for me. And from age 13, we started messaging on MySpace Messenger. Wouldn't you know it? And um, from 13 to age 17, Kaylee and I's relationship was very up and down. We couldn't decide if we wanted to be together, if we didn't want to be together. Honestly, it's a great story. I think that one day they may make a, a rom-com about it. And I would be played by the great Ryan Gosling <laughs> for obvious reasons. And... Uh, so our relationship was up and down, and we couldn't decide are we going to be together or not. And what I'm trying to say is Kaylee dumped me three times, not to put her on blast, but three different times she dumped me. The first time, she said God told her to. <laughs> Anybody grow, any brothers grow up in church and you know you've ever heard God told me. And it's like, we well, can't argue with that. Like, I can't be like, go tell him we have a good thing going on here. Like, I can't. Second time, she said she needed to focus on her relationship with Jesus. I said, that's a lot like the first excuse you gave me. <laughs> and the third time, she said that she was Ruth and looking for her Boaz, and I just wasn't Boaz. I just didn't make that. <laughs> Fortunately, we made it work. Nine years later, two kids later, it worked out. We're, we're really strong now. But I think that many times... We laugh at that, but we have made the love of God to be as inconsistent as two teenagers who have not grown up yet. Like one day God's going to love me, but maybe if I don't behave well enough, then maybe he's going to change his mind. And we need to understand, here's what Lamentations 3 says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and he never runs out of mercy. The Bible is constantly using this phrase, the steadfast love of the Lord, which means his love is steady. It is unwavering. It never changes. It is consistent. Did you know Jesus loves you today just as much as the day he carried a cross and wore a crown of thorns? Jesus' love is unchanging. It does not fade with time. Jesus' love does not fade when we are inconsistent. And I think that the enemy would love for us to buy into the lie that when I'm good, he loves me, and when I'm bad, he doesn't. I want to show you one of my favorite scriptures in all of the Old Testament. This is Isaiah chapter 54. I think it's verse 9. It says this. To me, this is like the days of Noah. Now pause for a second. How many of you believe that God is never going to flood the earth again. Raise your hand real quick. Majority of us believe this. Why? Because in the story of Noah, God floods the earth, but then he gives a rainbow, and he says, Be, because you see this, this is a sign of my promise that I will never flood the earth. God adds to the promise here. When I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth, so now have I sworn that I will never be angry with you. So we believe with confidence, God, you're never going to flood the earth again because you gave us the rainbow. I believe it. But God's saying, in the same way I promised I won't flood the earth again, I'm promising I'm never going to be angry with you. We say it like this. God's not mad at you. God is madly in love with you. And that's not just a one-liner that we put in Instagram bios. We got Bible that backs this reality. God will never be angry with you. In the same way I've sworn, I will never 
be angry with you. And yet we oftentimes view God as like a grumpy judge. Now God is a judge, but when God called himself judge, he did not have a Western courtroom in mind. He, we oftentimes, here's how we picture God. We picture God behind the desk. He's holding a gavel with white knuckles. He's got the black robe on. He looks angry. Looking at us, he looks like Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. Come on, millennials, where you at? Our view of God is that he is this angry judge, but, but God, when, we, when we say God is judge, he has something entirely different in mind. In fact, God wrote a whole book about judges. It's called Judges. And, and in the book of Judges, God gave these judges a job description. He said, here's your job description. Deliver the children of Israel from your enemies. So when God calls himself a judge, he is calling himself a deliverer. When God calls himself a judge, it is a rescuer. It is a liberator. He is the one who sets us free. He's the one who breaks bondages. He is the one who heals sickness. Come on, can we celebrate the fact that when he calls himself judge, his judgments aren't aimed at you. They're aimed at everything that is in between you and him. I've heard it said like this, that the judgments of God, see, this is why I can get excited when I hear about the fact that God gets angry. I can get excited about the fact that God has wrath because the wrath of God and the anger of God is not pointed at you if you are in Christ. It is pointed at every enemy that has set itself against you and his love is pointed right at you and he's not going to change his aim. He's not going to, he's not going to change his aim. His love is for you. Consistently, did you know that your behavior has nothing to do with the way God loves you? You could live sinless for 10 years and God would not love you more. You could sin every day for 20 years and God would not love you less. Why? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We need to learn how to see God differently. Well, Pastor, you don't know who I am. You don't know the things that I've gone through. Surely you're talking to good church people right now. And the truth is, this is what the word of God says. If you're saying, man, God, like I've, I've asked God for forgiveness so many times and it hasn't worked. Surely I'm bothering him. Surely he has run out of mercy for me. Here's what the scripture says, that he delights in mercy. So he's not enduring you. He enjoys you. He delights in mercy. That means he gets excited when he gets to show mercy to you. You know the feeling that you get when you clock out of work to go on a vacation? Or the feeling that you get when you walk through the front door and your kids run up to you and hug your neck. Or the feeling that you get when it's payday and that direct deposit hits. Come on, somebody. That is the way God feels when he shows mercy to you. He delights in it. He's ecstatic about it. We've got to change the way we see God. The second thing we need to change our mind about it, we need to think differently about ourselves. I think there's probably people in this room who would say, I know God is good, and I know God is love, but, but I'm broken. And I'm not worthy of love, and I'm a sinner, and I'm empty, and, and I'm like the house that you passed in your hometown. And I think everybody battles with this, but I'm going to go back to the text, and I think God is going to uh, set some of us free. But look back at John chapter 8, verse 10. It says, when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Jesus was not asking her this question because he was genuinely curious. Jesus was asking her this question because he wanted her to see what he saw, that every accusation has been lifted from your life. Where are your accusers? She said, no one, Lord. And, and he said, neither do I condemn you. This is a picture of what happens in my life and in your life when we give our life to Jesus. Or we would say when we get saved. One scripture that we quote almost weekly uh, is in the book of Romans that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord uh, and that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. And when we say saved, that is not just saying that God is going to reluctantly allow you into heaven when you die. The words say, when we become saved, God declares over you, you have no more accusers. 
every sin that could have accused you in the past, Jesus lifted that. And, and here's the biblical word for it. You have been justified. Justified. What does justified mean? It's just as if I have never sinned. Another word for justified is the word righteous. It, it means I'm in right standing with God. Well, how do I become righteous? I work really hard, right? I try really good and, and I do really good things. No, here's how we become righteous. When you put your faith in Christ, God gives you righteousness as a free gift. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, one of my favorite verses. I've been saying that about every verse that I've said today. It says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the cross, Jesus was making a transaction. He was pulling the sin of humanity off of humanity and placing it on Jesus. He took the righteousness of Jesus and placed it on everyone that would put their trust in him. When Jesus died on the cross, he did not just die for you, he died as you. And now, what is your position? You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You want to know one of my biggest pet peeves with church people is when people say, well, brother, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I don't know why I did the southern accent. I was a youth pastor in Mississippi for a while. Brother, I'm just a sinner saved by the good grace of the man upstairs. It's just a sinner saved by grace. I'm like, no, 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 pick one. Are you a sinner or are you saved by grace? Now, clarification, <laughs> clarification, do we sin? Yes. Are we fallible? Yes. In fact, 1 John says that if anybody claims to be without sin, they're a liar and the truth is not in them. 1 John is savage. Go read it. But our identity is not in the mistakes that we make. Our identity is in the cross of Jesus Christ. And freedom and liberty actually comes through that reality. Did you know freedom from sin does not come when you say, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. It's when you say, you're good, you're good, you're good. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a son of God. You're a daughter of God, that's how you live a life of freedom and victory. It's through the reality of sonship. It's the reality of what he purchased for you on the cross. Can I tell you, I got two sons and they both look exactly like me and they have never tried to look like me. They've never woken up in the morning and said, I just wanna look like dad. No, 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 they're, they're my sons, so they look like me. Sonship comes from the reality, God is love and I am forgiven. God is love and I am forgiven. And that reality will propel you into a life of victory. Now, I know there's probably people who are saying, hey, this is too good to be true. I think this is a cheap grace. I think that this is a greasy grace. I think that this is a little bit heavy on the grace, and you need a little bit more law mixed in there. And, uh, but here's the reality is the gospel is good news. So is it too good to be true? No, it's good and it's true. It's good news. But I think the problem is we live in a culture that has made good a synonymous with mediocre. Like, if we have a good meal, and it's like, how was the meal? He's like, yeah, it was good. But it wasn't great. It wasn't incredible. And, and, and so I think it's hard to see the gospel as, like, mind-blowing news because we call it good. But I started thinking about God's high standard for the word good. I started thinking about the book of Genesis. God created the world in six days with his words. This is mind-blowing. And after six days, on the seventh day, God rested, and he's looking at his creation, and he said, it is what? Good. good. Now, if I'm standing with God when he calls all of this good, I'm going, hey, no, 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 no. This is mind-blowing. This is breathtaking. Look at the stars. This is incredible. Look at the rivers and mountains and valleys. This is miraculous. You did this with your words. God, this is, this is incredible. And God says, yeah, it's good. And then he comes to humanity and says, I've got news and it's and it's good, which means it's mind-blowing. It's miraculous. It's breathtaking. It's, I can't believe I get this news. 
Can I help you with something? It is not good news if you've got to clean up first. It is not good news if you've got to be perfect before he loves you. It is not good news if I've got to attain righteousness by my own actions. What's good is a God who sees a woman caught in the very act, red-handed, and he stoops down in the dirt and says, where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Stop striving for something you already have. Let me illustrate it to you, because I think that this is important. Have you ever lost your keys? You learn a lot about someone when they lose their keys. I remember one time I lost my keys, and I was in a hurry, and I walked into uh, the, the house because I went out to the truck, and I didn't have my keys. And so I walked into the house, and uh, I, I look in all the places that I normally look, and when I don't find them there, I start flipping out. And I start flipping couch cushions, and I'm looking under the bed, and I'm unmaking the bed. And when you don't find your keys after a little while, that's when you start blaming the person you're betrothed to. Kaylee, where'd you put my keys? I know you've been cleaning it. I know you moved my keys. And Kaylee's like, I don't know where your keys are. And we're like, where are my keys? Get keys. And we're going back and forth. And Kaylee asked me the dreaded question, have you checked your pockets? <laughs> like, that's insulting. <laughs> I am insulted. Of course, I check my pocket. And then I find that in my right pocket right here are the keys that I needed. I was in possession of the thing that I was striving to find. And I think there's a lot of people, you are frantically searching. You're flipping up the couch cushions. You're looking around. You're banging your head against the wall. You've been doing it your whole life. When will I be enough for this holy God? When will I gain his approval? When will I gain his delight? When will I earn his love? And God is saying, check your pocket because you already have the righteousness that you're trying to attain. It's good news. You already have it. You already have it. When I realize God is love and I am forgiven, many times the people's response would be, if God is love and I am forgiven and I'm righteous no matter what, then I can live in sin without guilt. But the reality is, when I experience the real love of God and forgiveness of God, it, it causes me to, it changes my desires to where I no longer desire sin anymore. We've got to change the way we think about sin. Look at, look at this, uh, what Jesus said to her. He's, the last words that he says to this woman. He said, before you go, let me declare these words over you. Go and sin no more. That's an audacious thing to say to somebody. Can you imagine me and you in a counseling session and we're talking about your thing and before you're like, you're about to walk out the door and I'm like, hey, hey, quick, uh, one more thing I wanted to share with you. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> like, Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, just like never. Don't ever do it. Go and sin no more. <laughs> this is an audacious thing for Jesus to say, but I think that we've forgotten that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. When, when I am exposed to the fact that God loves me and I am forgiven, sin starts to lose its power. It's like this, when, when I realize that I am washed white as snow, I'm lo not looking for opportunities to mess up what God has given me. Have you ever bought a brand new pair of white shoes and you're walking like this everywhere you go? You're not looking for puddles to jump in. Why? Because I want to protect and honor this gift that I have. And you need to understand that you have been cleansed. You are white as snow. When we put our, tr our trust and faith in Jesus, he makes you righteous. He calls you justified. And that sets us free from the power of sin. See, in the old covenant, it was flipped the other way. In the old covenant, it was you bring a sacrifice and then I'll release mercy. Jesus flipped the script. He said, I release mercy and that empowers you to become a living sacrifice. It's not I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. It's God, you're good, you're good, 
you are good. If we could have a revelation of these two things, God is love, I am forgiven, the conclusion is sin has no hold on me. Sin has no hold on you. I think that we need to make that our mantra. God is love, I am forgiven, sin has no hold on me. God is love, when I'm fearful, God is love, I am forgiven, and sin has no hold on me. I feel like there's some people who've been dealing with shame of things that have happened years ago. I need to speak over you. God is love, you are forgiven, and sin has no hold on you. The good news is really this good. There's still a problem in the text that is unresolved. It's a cliffhanger. You ever watched a movie and the movie comes to a close and you're like, wait a minute, whatever happened with the dad? You know what I mean? Or whatever happened with this? They never clarified on this. So like there's this unresolved problem in the text. And the problem is there's a bunch of stones laying on the ground. You remember the Pharisees, they picked up these stones and they were getting ready to stone this woman. They these stones represented the penalty for this woman's sin. And here's the reality. Sin always has a penalty. Sin cannot go unpunished. Proverbs 11 says the wicked will never go unpunished. So, the, so there's a problem that he's got these stones there. And, and not only is this problematic for the text, but it's problematic for Jesus because Jesus is two things. Jesus is a God of justice and he is a God of mercy. So what do I do with the stones? If he's just a God of mercy, then he would have said, yeah, you can go ahead and go and sin no more. Don't worry about the stones. If he was just a God of justice, then he would have picked up the stone and executed judgment himself. But he's both. God of justice and God of mercy standing there in front of a pile of stones. So what do we do with the stones? And I think it's important for you and I to figure this out because she's not the only one who's collected stones. You and I have been collecting them all, all our lives. I lied. Here's a stone. I cheated. Here's a stone. I didn't honor the word of God. Here's a stone. We've been, we have been piling up stones our entire lives. So what does the God of justice and mercy do with the penalty for our sins? And here's God's answer to the stones. It's called the cross. Because the Bible says that on the cross, Jesus took the penalty. Jesus took the stones. Jesus took what we deserved on himself and took the full pay. Your debt has been paid. There's no more accusers. There's no condemnation. Because when Jesus was nailed to the cross, your stones were nailed to the cross. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, your shame was nailed to the cross. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, your guilt was nailed to the cross. He's a good God. He wants relationship with you. God is love. You are forgiven. Sin has no power. I want to show you one more scripture and then I'm going to be done. This scripture is my favorite scripture of all. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17, if you could pull that up for me. This is just... Oh, this is beautiful. Then Christ will make his home, everyone say home, in your hearts as you trust him. Jesus wants relationship with you. Jesus wants to dwell with you. He wants to make your heart his home. And I know there's probably people in this place, even after this message, you say, I'm in need of a comeback. And the answer is to let him in. But you're saying, my heart is so broken. And my heart is so wicked, and you don't know my heart, Pastor. You don't know the thoughts that I've had. You don't know the things that I've struggled with. You don't know the contents of my heart. It is a, not a fit home for a king. And if that's what you would say, my response to you would be this. I grew up in a small town called Effingham, Illinois. And I could get to most of the places in the city by bike. And there was this one particular place that I would ride past. And there was this abandoned house. It was ugly. 
It was nasty. It had broken windows. It had rotten wood. It had missing floorboards. You're looking at me like I've said this to you already. There was, there was, there was this abandoned house, and I remember passing that house as a young man. I remember riding by. I remember seeing that house. I remember seeing David, the adulterer. I remember seeing Moses, the murderer. I remember seeing the woman caught in the... I remember passing this house and saying, who would want to live in that house? You'd have to be desperate to want to live in that house. You, you would have to be out of your mind and out of options if you wanted to live there. And yet I was, as I was writing this message, I felt like God reminded me that that house is a physical representation of this woman who was caught. And not only is it a representation of her, but it's a representation of Moses and David. It's a representation of my heart and your heart. This, is, this house is us. And yet Jesus, who has unlimited resources, who can live in a palace or in a mansion where Jesus comes from, the roads are literally paved with gold. Jesus was passing this house, looking for a place to call his home. He comes to a screeching halt and says, I want to live there. That's where I want to make my home, that heart, that house, that broken person. That's where I want to live. Here's what we do. Say, Let me clean up the house first. Let me clean up the house for it. Let me at least paint it, Jesus. Let, let me fix the floors. Let me fix the windows. Let me, let me at least fix with this, this addiction before you come close. And Jesus says, I would really like to move in today. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and came close to us. While we were yet sinners, he came from heaven to earth or he stooped down into the dirt. If we would allow Jesus to come into our hearts today, this is what it looks like. Jesus comes in brick by brick, stone by stone, project by project. He makes our hearts whole. And there's going to be moments where Jesus fixes something, steps back and says, look at how beautiful this is. And we come and tear it down with our decisions and with our, with our actions. And when we do that, he doesn't move out because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases.